Labor Day, Labor Day. Do you enjoy this holiday? Does it cringe a little bit you think about Labor Day because of bad memories of laboring? I hope not. I hope not. I hope you've enjoyed them. I'm going to forgive me. I thought about cutting a couple of things out of my sermon this morning, kind of move things along. But um, and you'll probably think after I tell you this little joke that I should have. This should have been the first one that cut. And I haven't told you a bad joke in a while, so here goes. You probably heard it before. Anyway, most preacher jokes have made their rounds. But this is one about laboring. A guy was out one day. He was a truck driver, and he was driving uh, a, a load of penguins to the zoo. Maybe 50 penguins in his truck. Truck breaks down. He needs to get them to the zoo right away. Guy comes up beside him and has an empty truck and he said, can I help? And the guy says, yeah, I can sure, certainly use your help. And in fact, here's $500. Take these penguins to the zoo for me. The guy said, okay. So the next day, he gets his truck fixed. He rolls into town and looks over to his, the side of the road, and there's this guy that had the penguins. There they are walking down the street. He's got 50 penguins following him behind. He goes up to him, and he says, I thought I gave you $500 to take those penguins to the zoo. And the guy says, yeah, you did, and I had money left over, so today we're going to the movies. <laughs> I know, it's sick, right? Every once in a while, I've got to get a bad one out. Uh, you saw it coming. <laughs> but, uh, okay, let's move along. Do you love your job? Do you love your job? Do you love your job? Have you loved your job? Some of you are tired. You still work. People still labor at home or with children or grandchildren or something, don't you? You can't get that bad joke out of your mind, can you? Uh, you... If we truly, if we truly, truly, truly thought Labor Day was a blessing and our work was a blessing, we should go into our boss tomorrow and say, I'll work for free. Oh, no. <laughs> no, that's not the American way. It's not any way, in fact. We, we, uh, the work of our hands rewards us. That's even, that's even scriptural. So, yeah, it's good to love your job. I, I hope you do. I love mine. You know, I feel like for the last uh, 18 years, I've had the, the best uh, calling position that I could have ever imagined to become a pastor, and even though there's ups and downs, just like any position, but, you know, it's never been without a blessing. So uh, I, I, I give thanks for the labor that I've been able to do. Some people feel like this. Remember this one, Tennessee Ernie Ford? You haven't seen him in a while, have you? And for some of the young people, he was a, a very gifted singer back in, on uh, what? 40 years ago, something like that. You load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt, right? Yeah, I, I couldn't sing it. He had a deep voice, so I remember right. And I don't even remember the name of the tune. Does anybody remember the name of it? 16 tons was the name of it. Okay. I just Googled and found, found this. I couldn't. Uh, but uh, Tennessee Henry Ford, it, I guess it speaks a little bit about sometimes the um, anguish and that it's, it is work. Work to some is a four-letter word. Uh, Labor Day, I believe, was meant to celebrate you know, the work of our hands and to have one final holiday for the summer, of course, but uh, it was meant to recognize and to be thankful that we had the, this that we have. I, I mentioned there's a lot of workplace advice, or the Proverbs speak to work, and there's a lot of workplace advice in the great book of Proverbs. And I won't read down through there, but I, there's some good ones. The first one up there is commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Get your Bible, mark these down. These are good refreshers, good reminders, good, good hope for you in, in times. Uh, there's some ones that are a little um, mindful to some folks. Uh, look at 10.4, lazy hands make you poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. Um, honor the Lord with your wealth. This is one that's important in our giving with the first fruits of what we have. A reminder, and even in Proverbs, that that our our giving is not a requirement. It's it's just it. It's part of our worship. It's part of who we are. It becomes part of what we want to do to glorify God and to glorify and to build His kingdom. And we give of our first fruits, the the first right off the top. It's I preached a sermon, and I probably should do it sometimes about how we sometimes take 10 apples and set them along the table and we, and we get down to that last apple and that's the way I presented the sermon and, and that's the one we're going to give to God. It's the very last one, but then we start eating that apple. 
And before you know it, that last apple is even taken up and we haven't given. So it's best to give that first apple, the first fruits to, to the Lord from the top. Um, 1420 for all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. You probably worked with a few of those people that are all about the talk, right? Not none of us, but there are a few of those out there. That's when we get should become a good witness or a good strength or good mentors for some of those people that do that um, or that way. And, and uh, I know Gordon's sitting down here now thinking, oh man, I, I could I need to dish some of those out at work sometimes, right? <laughs> but sometimes it's it, being in charge can be a challenge for some as well. I know, um, know that from my past as well. So we have to be good, we have to be patient, we have to persevere sometimes what's going on in life. Um, John Wesley, here's your Wesley quote from this morning. He said it this way about our financial being. He says, earn as much as you can. Yeah, everybody says, amen on that. Save as much as you can. Give as much as you can. And he said at his deathbed that I think he had a couple of coins and a thimble. And he said, I fear that's too much. He'd given it all away. That was his nature of, uh, of who he was. Um, Colossians. This is from the message. Written a little bit different than your NIV version, King James Version. But it says servants. Calling you servants as laborers this morning. As we recognize this Labor Day weekend. Do what you've you're told to do by your earthly masters. You ever had a master? You kind of thought, oh, I don't know if they know what I'm supposed to do. But do what you're supposed to do. And don't just do the minimum that just gets by. Good advice for these young men back here. Don't just do the minimum. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master, for God. Confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. The sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Doesn't cover up. So give, share, give of your heart, give of your life, and be an example in doing so. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit this morning, just real quick. We're going to run through some examples. Before we get to this, I need to take a moment for prayer. Lord, you are the ultimate example of, of a servant. We know you labored with your hands as well. We know you gave everything for us. Lord, forgive us when we fail to acknowledge, to do, to see, to give as you would have us to do. Teach us through your scriptures this morning, I pray. Amen. First of all, Jesus served. It's not always popular, but always know that your service, your service as an example can show what God is doing in your life. From Mark's, the Gospel of Mark chapter 6, um, <laughs> It says about Jesus, isn't this the carpenter? Jesus had a real position, a real work. He worked with his hands. He was a carpenter. He worked in everyday life. It's not always popular. In fact, through this passage, they say, you know, and he just that no, nothing from Nazareth. Sometimes it's hard to stand out. Sometimes we feel like through our work that we're beat up or we have been beat up and, and nobody, you know, cares. But we continue to serve as, as we continue to work as if we're working for Christ. Let's look at another example. It's possible to serve God at work. I believe it is. To be an example in doing so. Servants is respectfully obey your earthly masters, but always with an eye of obeying the real master, Christ. Don't ever take your eyes off of him. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants, doing what God wants you to do. I like this one too. I think this one is so important. And you, your co-workers appreciate this so much in life if you work with a smile on your face. Work with a smile on your face. So if you're working in, that, in our food truck, Next week or two weeks from now and then at, at down at the Fall Festival, you'll have a lot more fun 
if you have a smile on your face, and we might have more customers. Work with a smile on your face. Always keep it in mind, no, no matter what happens, you're give, happens to be giving, whoever, I mean, I'm going to skip over that. You're really serving God. <laughs> good work will get you good pay from the master. Scriptural teachings this morning. Another point. I want to share with this one. Daniel. Remember Daniel? Don't hear a lot about Daniel. He was, uh, uh, this happens uh, 550 B.C. time frame in there to 600. Daniel was a, a loyal employee to some respect. He had been in Judah, the southern kingdom, okay, and they had all been taken. His world had been pulled out from under him. They'd all been taken into captivity captivity by the Babylonians. In other words, they put into slavery. Okay, but Daniel, because he was recognized as, as a good man, as a good worker, he began to rise up through King Nebuchadnezzar's court. And, you know, it's, it's not easy being a righteous man, I believe, in a political position. But he became, continued to be a righteous man and was always recognized for that. Nebuchadnezzar dies. Some difficulties within the kingdom. Finally, King Darius and his comes in and, and becomes the new king. Does that throw Daniel out? No. Daniel, Daniel is such an asset, he begins to rise up through King Darius' court. So what happens? All those working with Daniel recognize how good he is and they resent that. They know also that Daniel is a man of God. So they go to King Darius and say, Darius, here's the deal. We've got, we think that people are not bowing down to you as king. They're trusting their own gods. They're looking to other guidance. They're not looking to you. So we think for the next 30 days, no one should look to their god except you, Darius. No one should pray to their god except you, Darius. And we're going to, we think you should pass an edict on that. And in doing so, if anybody does bow down to their god, you know, you know what happens? Lion's den, right? Not a good date to have. Okay, so you see Daniel there in the picture, looking up on the right. Now, on the, I like the one on the left even better. I don't think that's a photograph. But he continues three times a day, not just once, not just twice, not, and, and out in the open. He is seen and bowing down and praying to God. He gets reported on. He gets ratted out, of course, that he did this. And it caused great pain, I believe, to Darius, because this is one of his tremendous workers, tremendous assets to him. And three times a day, he got down on his knees, he prayed, he gave thanks to God. He was obedient to God, he was a good worker, he was a good example to others. But yet, he had to issue this edict, it's what he had come up with. His promise was that this would happen. So the man said, you're going to do that, right? So he did, reluctantly. He throws him in the lion's den. But when he, the next morning, when he'd come near to the den where Daniel was at, he cried out with a troubled voice. So you see that troubled voice, that's important because Darius did not want this to happen. It was a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has you... Daniel, servant of the living God, has you, God, whom you constantly serve? Servant of the living God has you. God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions. Yes, he was delivered from the lions. That made such an important mark on Darius that he issued a new decree after he got rid of those who forced Daniel into this, offering reverence and love and respect for God, this God that Daniel served. He says, he rescues and he saves. Amen? That's what God does. We've talked about that all morning. He rescued and he saved those folks in Texas. He's rescued and saved us in our life. That's what he does. He performs signs and wonders. See, what, why I bring that up this morning is Daniel made such a difference in his workplace that it even changed a king and what he was going to do next. And I believe we as Christians, and we as the body of Christ, can have to have that effect today. 
And we can have that effect today on others. We can show Christ to others. We're all ministers where we are. That means when we go to work or we go into whatever, whatever location we're at. You know, it's not four-letter words spewing out of our mouth. It's not, I hate this, or I, you know, I'm so down on this. Continue, continue to show Christ to others. You know, Christ shows His love for us when we so least deserve it. And He continues to pour out His grace, pour it out to us and into us. So that what? So that we'll just, you know, go out and, like we're doing? No, that we might be saved. We might be sanctified. We might be changed. We might be transformed. John and I were talking about this morning. Might be transformed into a new life. That can happen in the workplace as well. I mean, there, there's nobody going to come and tell you. I, I know Christmas now, what? So many can't say Merry Christmas in the workplace. They have to say Happy Holidays. But you can still do it with a smile on your face and, and with love in your heart towards others. We're all in the priesthood of believers. You're all priests. You're all preachers. You're all pastors. You're all those who show Christ to others. Why? Because He first loved us. And He pours that into us. He calls us out of darkness into a new light. For God is working in you. God is at work in you. My favorite passage in Philippians, He continues to work in you. Work in you. Work in you.